Hi, for this chapter nine, PowerPoint slides, and we're talking about global information systems. And of all times in the world, heck, this is a good time. Well, it's increasingly been so important, information systems and just products and business globally. So what we're going to look at in this chapter are some of these learning outcomes. Why global? And that's one thing for a lot of Americans. We don't really think so much about the world and where our products come from, where our products go to, and really why we're using, why are products shipping all around the world all the time? And then we'll look at, in particular for this class, in business, what about information systems for global business, including e-business and the internet? So much incredible growth. We'll look at information systems and what kind of requirements they have and components. One of the things I want to focus on is some of the organizational structures and then hugely, what are some of the obstacles and what are some of the risks? A lot of us know about the benefits, but what about some of the things that can go wrong? What are some things to be aware about? So first of all, why go global? Well, let me ask you a question. Right now, what percentage of the Earth's population do you think lives in the United States? So what percent of the world's population do you think the United States of America, 20%, 30%, 10%? Seriously, what percent of the world's population do we comprise? Most people that, is, that are born in America really don't know, <laughs> but it's about 7%. So that means there's 93% of the world living outside of our borders. And we have a lot larger economic impact than five to seven percent of the world, but that's about our population. Our global market for our products, a lot of times we have to live overseas. We look at some of the companies at the bottom of this slide, you see, well, Toyota, of course, is a Japanese company, but do they build some of their cars here? What I'm going to highly recommend is you go look at some of the videos associated with this chapter. There's an incredible amount of information to learn from some of the videos associated with this chapter. Nike, Caterpillar, Ford, these are all American companies. A lot of their sales are overseas. And if we were in the classroom and I had much more time, I would ask you why, for example, would a Ford not sell so well overseas? And we can look at things like Home Depot. Do they have to sell different products in countries other than America? Bright Red, what is one of the challenges to selling a Ford or a Home Depot product, like a screwdriver, not a screwdriver, but a, a wrench in another country? What's one is The answer to that is we are the only country on earth it used to be including Angola and Burma are the only countries that do not use the metric system. Okay, so if you want to sell a car into another country like Japan and say, well, we use half inch screws, bolts, nuts, whatever, <laughs> not a screw, but a half inch bolt, they need a whole new set of tools. We measure our tires in, anyway, pounds per square inch, how about a metric system? Okay, so why go global? Again, global products are becoming increasingly important all around the world. Some of the videos you can watch for this chapter include, how does a car get put together? A car may get put together in Mexico. And um, maybe the metal coming from Brazil so all kinds of different parts and transmissions from Sweden, Volvo makes a lot of neat products. So things are moving all around the world. And when we get into the reducing costs in purchasing, manufacturing, distribution, and warehousing, nobody wants to get thousands more motors than they need that month. So we want to get them just in time. So what else? What other than peak labor? Most of us are aware of much, much cheaper labor in many countries built in Mexico. Why are they assembled in Mexico? Well, of course, the labor rate per hour in general is much lower in many other countries. But what else? 
why else would something be made somewhere else? Could it be that people can work more hours, less hours? Maybe, as we probably are aware of, and I've toured some of these places in India that are kind of scary, some of the factories, um, where it's not exactly the same occupational safety and health administration setup we have over here. Um, and what else? How about why are some things made in Brazil? Well, they have access to raw minerals that they may not have in Japan or South Korea. So raw minerals, labor, um, skill sets. You can get wonderful things done in Germany that maybe you cannot do. Again, I worked for three years in Nigeria. We'll get to that in another slide. So why go global? If we want to expand our market share, anybody, Procter & Gamble. Um, beer companies probably not because most countries in the world make better beer. But we're going to be looking for overseas locations to sell our products and one incredible thing the more you study this this to me is fascinating i lived four and a half years of my life overseas and like how do we sell shaving cream or um, nutritional products in countries where people work for literally a dollar a day how do you do that well that's a fascinating business and shaving cream can come in little, little bitty containers or toothpaste in little containers. And people use much, much, much more sparingly. We are a very wasteful society over here. Okay, let's look at e-business. This is something that most of us are aware, you know, Amazon is huge. Is Amazon the largest provider of electronic commerce? The answer is, well, is Amazon the largest provider of electronic distribution products? I'll challenge you, watch their videos that are out there and see what the answer is. <laughs> you probably think the answer is yes, but is it? Okay, um, new opportunities for conducting commercial activities. Let's say you buy a ticket to a concert. Literally today or yesterday, I got a transcript for my son is graduating from Grossmont College. He got accepted to San Diego State. So he gets a free transcript. Still, I had to pay three or two dollars and seventy-five cents or something like that. Why? It it wasn't going to Grossmont College, and it did not go to San Diego State. The opportunity was the company that actually does get even to a movie. There's always going to be a fee added on, so nobody gets it. But a third party is is just processing the transaction, kind of like. Two or three percent surcharge on a credit card transaction. That's another example. Okay, so new opportunities for intermediaries, just like this. Um, so Airbnb, again, on and on and on. The e-business associated with this. Airbnb takes a significant percentage of the amount. If you pay a hundred dollars to spend a night somewhere, the person selling you the room is not getting a hundred. They're getting a, a lower amount than that. Um, but Look at the bottom line, small businesses can lower their costs because that makes it easier. College who would normally have a, a paid employee sending a transcript, that can be done by a third party. So there's, and this is matched all around the world. This is all around the world. Shipping, maybe you don't need a shipping department anymore. How about just giving your products to you know, FedEx or UPS or DHL is one in Europe. So there's many other companies. So it's just some of the ideas. Um, we'll cover a couple more slides and I'll take a break. Growth of the internet, part of daily life all around the world. Not all around the world. There's still some places that are digitally, digital deserts, we'll call them. It's oftentimes in the jungle or the desert or often an island. But um, so now you've got a company and you want to build a website, let's just pick uh, Home Depot or Federal Express, and you want to make a website appealing to global customers. Well, what are you have now different websites, depending on what country you're coming from? Why would this be important? Well, um, obviously, I think languages. If you're in Mexico or Spain, or Colombia, you would probably prefer to see your website in Spanish. If you're German, they may not care because they mostly don't speak English, but still German, French, whatever the language is. 
What else? What are some other factors you think about? Other than language. How about price? How about colors? I've got a wonderful link here about color meaning examples. So let's try it. What do different colors mean in different countries? Perhaps. Mm, let's see. What, let's pick red. Red is the one that comes up here. Let's see, what does red mean? Well, red symbolizes love and passion. Oh, like Valentine's. Uh, how about in India? Fear, wealth, purity, love, marriage, and beauty. Hmm, a little different. Red marks Sunday. Okay, every day is represented by a certain color. Now you want to sell your product in Africa. Death and grief. So a Valentine's red may have a different meaning depending on where the heck in the world you're trying to sell something. Blue, positive and negative meanings. In North America, trust and serenity. Okay, that's new to me. In China, it's a symbol of femininity. Blue is masculine in North America and Europe. <laughs> so you see what I'm getting at? There are some um, vastly different meanings to this. Okay. These are just some of the globally to take into account. Let me pause for this and we'll continue on in the next video.